Hi there, I know you're very excited. You must have had an amazingly good lunch and a wonderful morning. Um, I'm really excited to, to start this third panel session in this great day. So I wanted to know how many of you are academics? Okay. How many of you are in the policy making kind of realm? Okay. How many are in the medical sector, doctors, nurses? Um, how many are in communities, work with closely with communities, kids, anyone? Um, yeah, any under 18 here? And also we have games to play. So um, even if we're not under 18, we can we can play in this session. So without further ado, thanks for um, joining here and realizing it was a room change. And also realizing that I'm not Matteo Galizzi. Um, I'm actually Barbara Fasolo. I am um, I work at the LSE, I'm a social professor in behavioral science at the Department of Management at the LSE. My office is here on the fifth floor. And I direct with Matteo the Behavioral Research Lab. And that was a unit that was involved in Periscope. And Matteo and I were super excited to join this, this large project that got us to interact with people we would normally not interact in terms of geographic location and disciplines and um, it's in a way sad that it's coming to the end, but my hope is that today we kind of lay the foundation for what's going forward as well. Um, Matteo, unfortunately, cannot be here today. This morning he had a family emergency, so he is on his way to Italy uh, at the moment. So I'll cheer, uh, but we really do everything together. So uh, imagine that he's with, here with me. Um, so without further ado, uh, in this panel session, uh, we will have, just in the spirit of the day, a mix of insights from academia, uh, mainly from us, from the work we did in the behavioral lab, from the policy making side. So we have Marta Schatze next. Um, she's joining us from the WHO Europe uh, Regional Office. And I'll tell her more about her, uh, tell you about her uh, more in a second. And finally, we'll conclude with Marco Brambilla, who's sitting very leisurely there. Uh, and you may have already engaged with him if you participated in the games just outside. If not, bear in mind that after this session in the break, you can participate in small sessions. So he's going to tell us more about, um, about these games. Um, so the way it's going to work is that I have a timer so that I will monitor myself as well. We want to have time for you to ask questions as well. So interrupt us, academics like to talk a lot. So I'll try to um, uh, limit all of us to about 15 minutes to tell us, uh, to tell you about what we found out. Um, after each there will be Q&A um, and that, that's gonna get us to 315, the break and the games. I'll go first, Marta, and then Mark, if that's okay. Great, so uh, you don't see Matteo, he's on his way to, um, Italy and uh, there's a Plutarchus as well. We work together uh, here from London in the Behavioral Lab to try and understand what were the reactions um, to uh, to the pandemic of a number of um, in, in a number of countries as well. We work very closely with two fantastic uh, research teams. Uh, one based in Germany at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, Janina um, team and Henrique, we all, we all got together in Como, I think some of us met them. And um, in Italy, the group at University of Trento, uh, Giuseppe Ventri is uh, the senior officer. Um, so the, the key questions that we try to address in the lab are these. I'll spend a bit more time to talk about the first question and um, the third question, and a little bit less of the other two, just for the sake of time. But the first one is really about what, imagine being back in the heat of a pandemic. The, the game is gonna get us there again. Uh, we may have had lockdowns, we may have had different types of restrictions. And at the time, we're all trying to do the right thing, to trying to, to see if, we could increase the acceptance of different vaccines that were 
accepted and approved across um, the different countries. And the question was, what is the most effective message, public health message that gets people to act and decide to vaccinate? And is that the same across different countries in Europe? So that's the, the, the first one. The second one was uh, really dictated by uh, behavioral research, which is kind of our multidisciplinary background. Um, was this, if you, um, if you announce this message, if you send these messages, is there a risk that there is an unintended, indirect, backfiring effect on them, as it's been found in, in several other domains? And the last two are the ones that we're really very keen on pursuing going forward, uh, which is, is there any bias in the way that the public, but also experts, uh, search for information uh, about novel pandemic or crisis? And if there is a bias, how do we go about mitigating it? And um, I'll also talk a little bit about the work we've done there. And that's really the work that we want to go um, and do um, going forward. And we'd love to know if you would like to be involved as well. So research question number one, uh, for those of us uh, that were not based in the, in the EU or in the UK, um, the, the belief was that the um, you know, vaccine hesitancy was really, was really bad over here in the US and the EU, worse than in the US, and 25% across, 25% um, in, um, in EU member states. Um, it's a big deal, and how do we decrease that? Now, our question was, well, is it really 25% in every single state? Um, is it the same in every single state and what to do about it? So in what um, was the first comprehensive mapping of vaccine hesitancy across Europe, uh, we ran a randomized control trial in, uh, here in the UK and seven other countries, including Bulgaria and Poland, where normally studies are not being run. Um, we surveyed over 10,000 individuals that did not get did not have any, um, any vaccination at the time. We started the project in April of 2021. We finished in June. And we made every effort so that the population would be representative across a number of variables. Um, I mentioned in a sec, but the most important really are age, gender, and education. And as you see, that makes really big difference to the effect. Um, you don't need to say this, but if you're curious about each country and how the breakdown is across the different socioeconomic uh, variables, um, that's that's what they are. Um, but what what did we what did we randomize? What were the messages? I'll um, I'll talk first about the message that um, we only ran in Germany where we started, uh, and then we dropped it because it was not significantly affecting vaccine uh, acceptance, and it was this. It was piggybacking on the idea that we try to be altruistic. And if you get people to think that by vaccinating, they protect vulnerable others, uh, babies, pregnant women, um, children, then you, you get them to motivate. And we didn't find that it was um, actually effective. So we didn't do that. There were three others um, and the control group. Um, so here are the three others. Uh, this is about conveying statistical facts in a simple way which is still pretty hard, um, which is with pictographs, frequency diagrams. So for instance, here um, you see the um, how many people would get infected and would die if uh, there's no, um, there's just a placebo on the left, in the middle if people get shot with uh, AstraZeneca, <laughs> vaccinated with AstraZeneca or J&J, and on the right hand side if people get uh, instead Pfizer or Moderna. And, and in that condition, people read a bunch of information and then we did that. The second message was instead completely different, um, no stats, no numbers, and it was kind of uh, leveraging on the desire of people to, uh, to be like normal, to go back and, and have a good life and see family and friends again, go to the movies, um, go to concerts and so on. And the third one was, um, informing people that there was such a thing, thing like the green pass or vaccination certificate that will soon be um, approved and introduced and that would be only released if people had two shots of, um, of COVID. 
we measured vaccine uh, acceptance or hesitancy um, by the answer to this question. If you're offered the COVID-19 vaccine appointment next week, what would you do? I uh, would we'll definitely get vaccinated or I get vaccinated, vaccinated, but it depends on what type of vaccine I, uh, I'm offered. That would be vaccine acceptance. Um, vaccination hesitancy was instead the answer, I'm unsure, uh, or I'll definitely not get vaccinated. Uh, the, um, the answers were quantitative and uh, also qualitative because we wanted to get to people's minds and what their beliefs were so people could comment on what were the reasons why they, they didn't want to have a vaccine. And here's basically the results. Um, first of all, in Germany, um, the um, altruistic benefits didn't work, but everything else worked. Um, and that was very hopeful. That's why we ran the three other conditions across the other seven countries. And here are the other seven countries. And how to make sense of all of these numbers is that there's not much bold. Um, there's one single bold number, which is for the UK on the right hand side, which means that the vaccination certificate message worked, got people to vaccinate, to be more willing to vaccinate. The red numbers are concerning because they talk to us about a backfiring. Mm -hmm. So in Italy and Spain, given all the stats and all the numbers of people actually infected and dying, actually got them less willing to vaccinate. Now, if you put it all together, you think, well, that's pretty, um, pretty depressing. What did we learn? But that's where we turn to quantitative analysis. We used machine learning, we used different models to try and understand what were really the effects at the level of communities, subsamples, groups. That's, you know, no one is average. And that's where we got more interesting results. And I'll just give you a, um, a quick review. Um, for, for instance, you know, in the US it was published that in, in, in Europe, vaccination hesitancy is 25%. But as you see, that's an average. There are some countries like Bulgaria where it goes over 60% and Spain it goes 6%. So we cannot generalize. Um, yeah. Men and women reacted differently. Women um, more vaccine hesitant. Um, we had, um, if you are curious, I'll share the paper. But we have all of these other measures uh, that look at social demographics and beliefs and personal characteristics. So here I'm just talking about uh, trust and misinformation because that was a theme during the day, and um, education and age and gender. Um, so going back to the same table, you see more um, significant results, more bold, more stars. Um, but saying that age uh, predicts vaccine um, hesitancy. Um, the uh, elder are more vaccine hesitant. And coming to social uh, inequalities, you find that with higher education, um, vaccine uh, hesitancy increases and with employment as well. So definitely education and employment helps. And you see how that was true across different countries. Uh, we're comforted when you see that that's true across different countries. We also looked at country level characteristics like uh, level of misinformation, uh, belief in conspiracy theories, trust in government. And um, we had, uh, in a way, thought about the different countries because they varied a lot on all of these dimensions. And when we ran more, more um, complex um, analysis, uh, heterogeneity analysis um, with machine learning, the model is called model-based recursive per, um, uh, partitioning approach. Anyway, what, what that means is that every single message actually did have an effect, which you didn't see because we were looking um, around the picture. So for example, I showed you earlier that the condition where we got people to think about how good it would be to, to have life um, back to normal and to hang out with family and friends. Now that uh, hedonic message does increase actually vaccine willingness with a particular subgroup. And that was the, it's the last um, row of this table. It's people that are in countries that are uh, have low levels of misinformation, uh, high levels of trust, uh, there was a lockdown in place um, and there was a low education and male, for example. 
the leaves varied a lot. So that's the other message that um, vaccination decision was really determined not by fact, not by information, but beliefs. And beliefs varied hugely across from the beliefs about side effects, plus it, beliefs about um, how the speed of development of a, of a vaccine affected the safety and so on. So um, what, what did we make of all of this work? Uh, first of all, that public health messaging, the public there is about health, but not about the message. The message needs to really be tailored, no one size fits all. We gotta also pass the messages in advance of rolling them out because it can backfire and that's really risky. Um, and we need to take into account individual level characteristics um, and country, regional, community characteristics. Um, I invite you to look at the research article. Let us know if you uh, want to have a copy and you can't have access because it tells you tells you more. Um, now, in the next five minutes, I'll try to tell you more about the, the rest of the work we did, but this was really the most important. Here, we basically try to make sure that our messages that you know, campaigns and so on are, um, are good if they learn, wouldn't backfire, um, as in they would not create a negative spillover effect. Um, they, uh, there was a concern um, around that, for instance, oh yeah, if you put, if you, if you get vaccinated, maybe you'll be less, less likely to wear a mask or less likely to do contact tracing. The good news is that we found no spillover effect. So there's no risk compensation. Um, which is which is good news. So we did that if you're interested by just adding another arm to the randomized control trial so that we had new people brought into our trial that had not been exposed to the messages. And all of them were asked, would you be willing to say donate to the NHS? Would you be willing to volunteer to mask uh, to wear a mask? Would you be willing to contact trace after um, being exposed or not exposed to those messages? So that was good news. And then um, this issue of the high impact of misinformation and beliefs got us to think about the role of uh, bias in how we search for information, not just for the members of the public, but for everybody, really policymakers and so on. So that's new work we're trying to um, we're, we're trying to complete at the moment. And um, in particular, we looked at one of the biases in the heuristics and biases, judgment and decision-making literature, uh, which is very relevant here, and it's called um, confirmation bias. It's a bias that is not due to a cognitive uh, deficiency. So you can't fix it with <coughs> more education. It's a bias due to one's belief. It's called a motivational bias. It's basically this idea that if you see information, you believe something strongly, you will see that same information in favor of your uh, belief or hypothesis rather than not. So you distort even neutral, ambiguous information. And um, there was no work um, on this, surprisingly enough, um, in the context of COVID and vaccine decision making. The little research was mainly connected with um, how people who are anti vax uh, or no vax would search for information, not about people who are pro vax. So that's what we set out to do. And we picked uh, what uh, has been considered by the WHO the next priority disease or potential pandemic virus, the Nipah virus, uh, which has much in common with um, COVID. And it is a concern to experts. Um, so in that program of research, we tried to figure out if there could be potentially confirmation bias in how people search for information, the way you do that is that first you run a baseline study where you don't tell people that you're looking at the potential pandemic, you see an infectious disease, and you give them facts, and you see how convincing they are. That's the baseline. And then we run two more studies. Um, the, the, this study was about determining if it was confirmation bias, and the way we did that was actually thanks to the uh, information that was already published on the WHO website. We use exactly the same information that we simplified because it was a lot. Um, and, um, and then we asked to um, rate the convincingness of different facts about this virus. And these are the key facts on the website. They're neutral. Okay, I'm done. There we go. Okay. Start the monitoring. Uh, I've done two minutes. Can I? Is that okay? So, uh, 
they did uh, rated this and basically yes we found confirmation bias we found confirmation bias not just so people who um would not want to vaccinate but also people who would want to vaccinate mm -hmm. um so that's the novelty there um and the i mean quickly we tried to figure out what to do about it the jvm and um, heuristics and bias literature has lots of cool techniques that could be used, but none of them had been tested in situations that we call polycrisis, when there's a heat of a pandemic. And um, in the second study, good news is that we replicated the bias. Yes, there is a bias on both the pro-vax and anti-vax, but trying to fix it is quite hard. So there's two techniques. One is the biasing, getting people to think about reasons why the opposite would be a good idea and trying to convince somebody, say I'm anti-vax, I'm trying to convince somebody why they should vaccinate and to do this three times um, or in nudge, getting people to think about what other people do and their regret they would feel and all of that. But um, really, we replicated the confirmation bias, but really the two other techniques didn't really help to change um, or, or lower the confirmation bias. What we found though, was that nudging isn't, um, isn't as good as the biasing. So going forward, we're really excited to um, expand this kind of bias mitigation agenda. That's what we really want to, uh, want to do because it's human. There's, it's a human way of processing information. So to sum up, tailor, test, avoid ambiguity. So uh, avoid statements that are too, um, too neutral because people would push them in the direction that they want, simplify and expect bias. Um, I'm keen to see if you have questions. Um, this is it's our, our details, um, Matteo and, and Plutarchus as well. We uh, open our lab um, next up in the next week. There's going to be an LSE festival here. It's going to be very engaging. It's a great um, week to come and explore what we do here in academia. But on Saturday from 1 to 4, we open the lab up for families and under 18 to come explore different themes. So um, it's also an invitation for you to get engaged if you, if you want. Uh, thank you. And thank you. I want an applause. I want to have if you I'll, I'll do now. I'm stepping back into my chair mode. Okay. Any questions? Yes. And can you could please say who you are and what yeah. what sector? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes, if, the way I understand it works is that you have to keep pressing and while it's red, you speak. Yeah. Yeah, and Tracy here from SEPS. so you mentioned several times that fire. So does it mean that? Uh, in order not to backfire, we don't tell the public the truth or the fact or the data. Yeah, that's interesting, right? So back, by backfiring, I mean that it does the opposite effect of what it was intended to do. And no, but, but that means that I'm all about trying to test so that we can actually have that not, not to happen. Um, overall, we are of the view that with the right knowledge of the right group, it's always better to say something, do something. No, because otherwise apathy and people will have their own, you know, idiosyncratic views. We need to give information about new stuff instead of making it up. Um, yeah, thank you. There's burning question, otherwise I'll, I'll move on to the next one. Yeah, go for it. Um. So I like the fact that you're saying, basically, to go into the, the, the people, there's a lot of people that are, are getting misinformation. So the thing you're saying there, I've, I've kind of been screaming this for a while, that I think that's where the government got it wrong. They kind of, it's almost like they threaten people into making a decision instead of giving people the information to decide for themselves. Yeah. And a lot of this information you receive on your mobile phone and, and some of these people are not going to, Phone 111, they're not going to vote. They're, they're going to go off a WhatsApp image. Yes. And they, or a video, and then they pass this on to their friends and they'll say, oh, it's my friend who's a friend of a friend of a friend who worked for a cleaner in the hospital. It's like, guys, mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not valid enough for me to go, no. oh, this is right about COVID. But a lot of people fell into that trap and believed it. 
and then didn't go. So I think what you're saying is really, really needs to be done because that's the other way to get the message across. Yeah, well, thank you for having come. So what, what sector are you? Oh, just curious. We're, we're carers and I work in uh, virtual and organ so I just wanted to... The caregivers. Caregivers, caregivers. yeah, great. Absolutely. So you, you do know about how it is important to actually involve uh, whoever you're taking care of with the decisions that you're trying to make. So my background is decision science. So I believe strongly in the fact that we shouldn't nudge people into behavior. They, they, they see it and we do better behavior. It's a decision. And, um, and people have to have the information so that they make the decision which is best. And that said, people sometimes decide without the, the right information. So that's why we are moving now towards this new direction of research into the way um, we can present information, create choice architecture, we call it, such that it's easier, simpler to find out new facts and make the right decision. And understand your preferences really for you, for your family, for everyone else. Thank you, very good point. Should we have one more and then we move, yeah. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. I'm just wondering, uh, in your research, did you also try to analyze um, the impact of who was delivering the message uh, in the government and who was the best, perhaps, actor or stakeholder uh, at delivering the message and how that influenced the people's reaction? Yeah, that's great. So in this one, um, it was always said it was the government of the country. But in our work, actually, that I've conducted um, related to this, we did vary, uh, for instance, in the UK, whether it was uh, the NHS, whether it was the BBC, whether it was a local um, local friends, and the um, the source that was most reputable were NHS and um, yeah, particularly the NHS and healthcare kind of websites. Lots of people kind of to look at online. In this particular study, we didn't vary that, but I can tell you that reference. I'm aware of time, so now as a chair, do, do you have a question? Well, I was, I was going to say something, but a little bit different. Uh huh. Go for it. Now, what I find really interesting about your work um, is that it's dealing with an issue that has come up a great deal in global health. Yeah. I mean, you know, the biggest global health program that's ever been attempted, probably before COVID, was nasty worm. Vast numbers of people have been offered tablets for deworming across Africa and elsewhere. And there's been almost none of this that people said. In well, fact, mm -hmm. there's been a withdrawal of funding from health education and health communication. The idea has been that if you just give people the tablets, you tell them to take them, that's the most effective way of doing it. Wow. And all over the place, we find that you should not consume the tablets. So for example, with schistosomatis, which I've worked on, uh, infection rates are higher now than they were before mass treatment <coughs> began 15 years ago. That it can be catastrophic failure that hasn't prevented the continuous rolling out of public health programs. But I'm just, it's sort of a slightly sideways note, but it's kind of interesting with COVID, partly because it's about us and our choices and our conspiracy theories and our rejection of treatments that we, we have a space for the sort of research you're doing. And a willingness to listen to it. Yeah, yeah, it's a great opportunity. This is, when we talk about opportunities of COVID, it's kind of, it's kind of some, sometimes people raise their eyebrows, like, what, what are you talking about? But this is exactly the type of opportunity to talk to each other and to create this fantastic opportunity for working together. We hope to work together in the new oh, center yeah. of the city. To Things, yeah, together. <laughs> um, yeah, without further ado, um, thank you all for the comments. And I really do hope you can take a screenshot of a email addresses and, and we keep talking. Um, now it's um, my pleasure uh, to introduce you to um, Marta Scherze. Um, Marta, can you um, see us? How can we see you here? Maybe. I, I can, I can see you. I can see the room <laughs> and I have a, I have a presentation to share. It's, yeah, it's telling me I can only share my screen if you stop. Can you sharing. hear me from here? Okay, great. So yes. I'll, I'll introduce Martha quickly while we get everything else sorted. So Martha is a global health professional with over 25 years of experience in project management, 
qualitative and quantitative research, health communication and behavioral insights in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Uh, much of Marta's work has focused on humanitarian response, HIV prevention, and community engagement. Since 2020, she has worked as a consultant to the WHO European Regional Office as part of the Behavioral and Cultural Insights, BCI. I love the cultural insights, um, cultural bit um, of the unit, where she coordinates uh, data collection and interpretation to tailor and guide response to COVID-19, the war in Ukraine, and other emergencies. So I'm really delighted to um, welcome Marta here. She's joining us from the US. So thanks for the early rise. And um, now Marta, you have 15 minutes and you'll, um, we'll ask you questions after that. All yours. Great, thank you. And just to confirm, you can hear me okay and you can see the slides. Yeah. Okay. Yes, we can. Wonderful, Wonderful. thank you. Thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to join this panel today. Um, already, Barbara, your presentation was so interesting and even some of the questions came up um, really fit well with the, the work that we're doing and, um, and where we hope to go in the future also. So I want to talk about um, kind of more of the experience of working with numerous different countries to collect some of this behavioral and cultural insights data, do the analysis, and then really try to integrate some of the findings into the COVID-19 response. And to talk about that, of course, we all need to take a, a little bit of a step back to 2020. Um, and just as we were learning about this novel coronavirus uh, was the same time that in the WHO Europe region, we were welcoming in a new regional director with a new European program of work. And you can see the, the top three goals of that European program of work there, um, universal health coverage, health emergencies focus, and then um, health and well-being over the, the life course or the three main goals. But as part of this also, the regional director identified uh, four new flagship areas of special focus and interest. And behavioral and cultural insights was one of those. So it's been identified as something important and a priority um, in the region at the beginning of 2020. Um, and yet we were just beginning as the whole pandemic was also beginning. Um, and I'll just add here, I won't read through the whole definition, but for us, um, BCI is really about um, systematically gaining insights and then really making sure that we use those insights to design and evaluate um, tailored messages, um, interventions, policies, all of that. And we do add the, the C for cultural insights um, because we know that context is also so important and that includes structures that people are living in. So we're really not only looking at individual factors here. So in early 2020, as we heard and we knew that WHO was recommending countries to include things like population level risk perception and um, issues around trust into their, uh, their COVID response along with epidemiological information and of course uh, health system capacity concerns, all of these things. Uh, we realized that we didn't have really a robust and kind of standard tool to offer to countries along with technical assistance for those who, who wanted some. Um, so we reached out to colleagues. We learned that Cornelia Betch and her team at the University of Erfurt at that point were just about to or maybe had launched the first uh, fielding of their COSMO study in Germany. Um, and so we worked with, with them. We, um, we adapted that survey tool somewhat for um, sort of broader uptake among all the countries um, in our region. And just to clarify, the WHO European region is actually 53 countries, territories, and areas. So it goes much beyond the European Union. And you can see on the map there, the, the lighter blue colors um, are where we supported countries very closely um, and they were mostly, not all, but mostly outside the European Union. 
Just quickly, um, the surveys cross-sectional design, repeated data collection, about a thousand people um, per round, representative by age, sex, and geography, where WHO was working closely with the countries. Uh, we had both national and WHO ethical approval. Data collection happened locally through, usually through uh, local data collection companies using um, telephone interviews, comp computer assisted telephone interviews, web-based interviews or a combination of both. And then we worked together with the University of Erfurt um, to help with uh, the analysis using our framework and did our best to make that available very quickly after data collection within about a week usually. Um, so 30 countries and areas in our region have used this tool. We worked very closely with 18 of those countries to provide some funding, but especially the technical assistance in this. Uh, we started data collection in sort of late March, April of 2020, and we are conducting a process evaluation now, and I'll come back to that um, in just a minute. So just briefly also, so you can have this kind of overview it's a fairly comprehensive kind of questionnaire looking at behaviors, perceptions, well being, and um, then a number of different kinds of predictors. <coughs> I want to share a bit about some of our results. Um, interesting also to hear Barbara talk about Bulgaria because that was one of the countries that we worked closely with as well. Um, and again, starting in 2020 with Bulgaria. Uh, they had some results in the first couple of rounds of data collection um, that showed quite low well-being, and they were able to bring this to um, other colleagues in, in the government and really use that to help influence and encourage the development of a new national strategy for mental health. In Georgia, they had um, some results showing there was lower awareness and lower risk perception among um, two different ethnic minority groups in the country. And this really helped advocate for um, additional human resources and other resources to develop targeted communication in these minority languages and to really reach out and engage with different influencers using different um, channels and different messengers to deliver those, um, in, that information. In Romania, they tailored uh, some of their questions quite specifically around reopening schools um, after or as we were coming out of the, the first major lockdowns um, and found that there was clear support for reopening schools with certain conditions, under certain conditions, and this helped to inform policy as well. In Slovenia, um, that was the Institute of Public Health there that was conducting the surveys and they added some questions about essential health services. And we're really able to use this to advocate again for a, a return to a full um, opportunity to access essential health services at a time when the government, the Ministry of Health was really trying to decide the best way to provide those services. So again, our focus really was at the member state level working with countries. This was not um, an, an academic exercise, really, we were doing this with the um, uh, uh, collaboration and coordination with um, ministries of health, with institutes of public health. So we were really trying to be very practical and integrate findings into what they were doing on a pretty regular basis. At the level of WHO and the regional office, oops, we... Um, also found that our results and having some of this data in many of the, the countries in our region um, really contributed quite a lot to the process for um, helping countries decide about which protective measures, the public health and social measures to enforce and the ways in which they might enforce them. Um, so this has been very useful. We, we continue to work closely with uh, the PHSM team same for risk communication and community engagement, where many of the countries we worked with really used their findings to help tailor and target some of the messages like Barbara was talking about, um, particularly around vaccination and to understand which groups, which age groups in their country um, 
men versus women, other issues, um, and how best to target their communication. And this now is um, it's a really helpful model to be able to point to and, and that people have the experience of doing that kind of work. Um, so that's kind of the overview, really quick overview of, of what we did, the kind of surveys and some of the results. But I wanna share some reflections and, and some thoughts about um, ways forward. So Barbara also mentioned um, the idea of COVID-19 as, as an opportunity, and it may seem a bit odd, um, but we certainly do see it that way in, in some instances. And one thing um, that I have experienced myself is hearing from people who are, are really biomedical experts and, and who previously themselves have said, you know, I didn't necessarily appreciate or, or understand the importance of the behaviors and really understanding and, and measuring and documenting behavior. Um, it's quite clear now, and many of these people are, you know, they're kind of on our side now, just in how important behavior is, how important people's cultural and structural context is to the decisions they make and, um, and how whatever solutions we have might really be rolled out and, and taken up. Um, working with so many countries had, uh, has definitely give us, given us an opportunity to build capacity um, in those countries and within governments for doing this kind of work. And where we are now and moving forward, um, we are in a quite strong position, I would say, to bring this kind of lens of behavioral and cultural insights to preparedness for future um, emergencies and into thinking about um, different kinds of response strategies. Of course, lots of challenges. And I would say the biggest one has been related to really making really good, strong use of the findings from this kind of data collection. Um, so that has to do with a lot of different things. I think the, the data, because it's about human behavior, tends to be complex and quite nuanced. And, um, and so how to really incorporate that into the decision-making progress process can be a challenge. Also, you know, we know that we worked very closely with technical colleagues at the Institutes of Public Health, even in the ministries of health. Um, and yet it was often um, much more political uh, decisions being made or um, other, uh, other decision makers um, who might not have access to or the same understanding of the data who are really making the decisions. So closing that gap, finding some ways to, to work more proactively together is, is really important for moving forward. Um, just as capacity building was a real opportunity, at the same time, we found that um, in some places, capacity was really quite low. And so the amount of capacity building needed is significant. And this has an impact on sustainability and moving forward, how much um, can be expected um, to happen in certain contexts where, um, where really more skills might be needed. Um, another challenge is around having a, a standard tool like we intended um, to, for use across multiple countries versus really having something that's very adaptable and can be really um, tailored to a local context to ask very specific questions and understand more about what's happening very locally. Um, and then of course, resources for all of us um, at the country level, at the WHO regional level, to be able to provide the kind of technical um, assistance and support and ongoing in-depth support. Uh, we were quite limited in that and we would love to see more resources available for this kind of work at national, academic, international, organizational levels throughout. Um, just to, to share, um, just um, in September of 2022, so just last year, we had a real milestone that um, we're very excited about that I wanted to share. It was the world's first resolution on BCI for health. And um, this was specific to the European region. Um, just last week at the World Health Assembly in Geneva, there was a, a global resolution as well. Um, but in September last year, we had this um, 
resolution in the European Union. And all, all 53 member states signed on to this and in doing so agreed to these five strategic commitments. Um, this resolution also includes an action framework and that includes a reporting requirement. So each of the countries has to actually report back on these five strategic commitments. As part of that, we've asked countries to identify a BCI focal point in each country. And we're working very closely with the focal points now on this reporting process. And we'll be having a face-to-face -face meeting with them in Copenhagen in September of this year. Um, so I feel I'm actually very excited about this as an expansion of this kind of BCI network. When I think back to 2020, if I had known there was a focal point and a person in each country with an interest in and some skills and background in BCI, um, what a difference that would have made to, um, to the work that we were able to do. So that's part of what we're looking forward to um, in the future. We are also doing some ongoing data analysis. We're looking at some meta analyses across countries and, and trying to find some trends that we can pull out. Um, as Barbara showed, just giving averages across all these very varied countries really does not tell us that much. So we need to find um, more useful ways of looking at differences and similarities between the countries. We are doing this qualitative process evaluation about the overall process of the surveys. And we expect that this will um, result in a report, but also a peer reviewed journal article. And then we'll really contribute directly to preparedness plans, again, around public health and social measures. There's an updated guidance coming out for that, which will include BCI, a strong BCI component, health literacy in emergencies also, and a, a more general BCI in emergencies um, guidance. We are really interested in talking about and um, identifying ways of strengthening data collection and use at the national level. And that may certainly be um, with collaboration and coordination with academic institutes at a national level. And then we continue to work with our, our focal point um, community of practice that I just described. We also have um, a technical advisory group uh, as the, the BCI unit has a technical advisory group. And um, that includes academics and others from throughout the region. So we're really, building on this experience, there's more to learn, there's more to really kind of pull out from this as we move forward. Um, but I, I wanna just add one thing because we had a, a, a question after the, the last presentation about um, the kind of deworming. And I think you mentioned schistosomiasis in particular, and I've done a lot of work in Africa as well. Um, so what we really are moving toward is trying to bring this perspective the, and the BCI lens to health very broadly. So um, not only for vaccination and not only for emergencies, but as everything, as interventions are rolled out, that this really should become an integral part of the work that we do and the planning that we do for interventions, communication campaigns, and policies. So. I will stop there. Thank you very much. We have um, an email address for you. If you have general questions, I look forward to taking any questions now and I'm happy to share the presentation as well. Great, thank you so much for an extraordinary milestone. So you already started answering a question or anyway, um, linking to a previous question. I'd like to invite a couple more questions. And um, heads up, I have to give sufficient time to Marco. We may be running five minutes um, late, as in, is it okay to continue till 3.20, everybody? Great. One question, please. I guess my question is how- Can you hear, Marta? You need to press? Yes. Yes, it has to be right. Yeah. And when we talk about behavior, there is history of colonization, colonizing views and the history of misused trust, especially in Netherlands and especially in European. How we can change that? Where you see people because 
It cannot come changing behavior with trust the vaccination straight away where you there is history where misuse all of it and how you can come for that. And now here, especially who have bad history in Africa, how are you going to change that? Thank you for the question. And absolutely, I agree that trust is just essential. It's a, a, a pivotal factor, pivotal issue in all in health communication, in providing recommendations, and um, hoping and expecting that people will follow recommendations. Um, what we were able to, to do, and I can speak to my experience working with the WHO Regional Office for Europe, and these surveys that in particular that we have um, supported work with is to, to try to understand and measure um, trust at a national level and how the a population trusts their government and um, how and where recommendations should perhaps come from in that in that regard. Um, so I I hear you what what I hear you saying is that um, the trust issue is often with WHO itself and I think particularly in Africa. That is, I, I would say, a very a, a larger question than what we might be able to answer today. I would absolutely agree that trust is essential, and I think being able to measure and understand trust um, also is extremely important. And then there are a number of ways of of trying to build, rebuild, and maintain that trust. Um, you know, very often, or one of the key factors is through transparency and clear communication. Um, I was we need to see the red for it to it work. Um, if it went red, great. Yeah. Uh, 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 it just hold it. Hold, on. hold it. Yeah. No, <laughs> we should use a, a a campaign, a messaging campaign to see how that works. So you just press. Okay. I'll, I'll, yeah, um, speak. can you hear, Martha? You hear no, no, you need to use the... Hello, um, that, was, that was really nice. So I saw, was I right in seeing that you had, when you've done your surveys, it was a thousand people in each country. Don't you think that number should be slightly bigger? And two, how are you going to get to the people that don't have tech? Because that is a massive problem. So wouldn't wouldn't an answer be that you'd have some kind of person that is in the, those communities that can one get you the numbers that you can believe in, and two get the information that you actually need instead of it just being a thousand people per country. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so one thing uh, maybe I'll start with um, the the one thousand sample size is something that. Um, we worked with uh, statisticians and quantitative people, which I, I am not a statistician, but we worked with other statisticians on an appropriate sample size. And 1,000 is something that's quite standard for, for a national level, nationally representative survey like this. Um, it does not allow for looking at a lot of subgroups, because if you want to look at only young people or only people in a particular geographical area, then you get to numbers that are really too small to be able to say very much about it. But at a national level, um, we feel comfortable with the sample size. Um, and I will say also that we were working with a, a lot of limitations at the time in terms of timing, because we were all really kind of um, under a lot of pressure at the, the start and throughout COVID-19 to do this kind of work. Um, so, um, and some other studies certainly have larger sample sizes, which is great, but we were working with uh, what we were able to do and what we felt confident, statistically speaking, doing. Um, in terms of the technology, um, we recognize that there were some people we would, would not be reaching but this was also why we did a lot 
of the um, the survey was done by telephone interviews, so people didn't have to have um, internet access or or smartphone necessarily. So we were trying at least to um, to balance that. Other um, other organizations, other surveys were done uh, like exclusively using Facebook data, and we did not want to do that. We felt um, that that really limited people. You're only talking to those on Facebook. So we were trying to, again, with the resources and human resources and other resources we had um, to get at the, the best kind of data that, that we could. And um, this is what we were able to do at the time. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, the questions. I'm now just mindful of time. So thank you, Martha. Um, it was a great complimentary to what we, um, we started that way. Now we're going to shift uh, a bit gears and we're gonna get into the data data world and game world. I'll leave this mark for here. So while we get set up, um, I'd like to introduce you to Marco Brambilla. He's professor of computer science at the Politecnico University in Milan, Italy. He leads the data science lab um, in Milan. And his current research interests are on web science, big data analytics, social media analytics, and model-driven model development. He invented um, a language which is called interaction flow modeling language and he's been involved in the creation of free startups. So he really uh, bridges the academic side with the industry practitioner side. So it's a great way to end. Um, and again, tell us what you're going to be doing also in the games. I'll leave it to you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I, will, I would like to take a perspective on the problem we are talking about now more from a methodological pers part, uh, perspective than um, say a deep discussion about uh, studies we did and so on. And I would like to find the intersection between these three ingredients. How do we blend behavior understanding, subjective perception of reality, and data and quantitative analysis? That's the challenge, which is basically unresponded, for sure, not by my research in my um, But the point is this, right? I mean, we see, and we have seen in the COVID uh, situation that a lot of things happen because people believe or perceive reality in a different way. People read data from their own perspective. People read the news uh, from outlets that take totally different perspectives on reality. And the problem is that all of this ends up in the, what I would call the active, say activation part, the, the actionability. You, you read, you, you get informed, you make uh, some kind of decision and finally you act. So how do we understand the connection between the perception and the choices you make? In healthcare, this is a problem. This is a challenge, let's say, because this leads to things like vaccination hesitancy, but also other aspects like whether you decide to go to work or not, or whether you uh, uh, raise uh, an opposition to uh, governmental decisions and so on. So this is the idea. Um, essentially, the point is, and we saw that in also in the other two presentations, that most of the time we, let, let's put ourselves in the set of people, we get a distorted perception of reality. Distorted because someone pushes it in that way, because we read it in that way, okay? Um, I, I'm going to show you some possible solutions to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will also tell you something about some results that came up out of uh, using these solutions. Some of them are here. What are the things that change the, uh, your, your behavior? Well, first of all, we have been talking about the role of government, the possible, let's say, manipulation, information and population. Well, that's something that came up very clearly in our studies. 
many people participating in the studies highlighted that the most confusing part of the pandemic was the information misalignment. The fact that you could read news anywhere and you could read something and just the opposite of that, depending on where you read things. Um, this, so misalignment, together with say clearly stressful settings, psychological uh, situations that could lead to um, even not necessarily pathologically, but somehow uh, anomalous uh, personal situations could lead to misunderstanding of reality. And these impacts on your long-term well-being. Uh, this is the last point. Um, we are dealing with an emergency, but we are also dealing with something that could have a very long-term result in individuals and in personal lives. Okay, so the point is essentially this. How do we blend uh, the possibility of letting people interact and share their positions and their ideas, not at the small scale, but at a global or large scale uh, set uh, 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 paradigm. So we have a lot of uh, ways of, I mean, many, many companies, many enterprises internally build, you know, co-sharing uh, workshops, idea scaling methodologies, these kind of things to, to somehow raise the creativity and the, and the sharing of information. But that's typically a very closed, organized setting. How do we make it scalable to, to large communities? That's the challenge, okay? Increase participation and also increase the scale. That's the thing. And this to me is exactly the point that was also discussed this morning about the connection between qualitative and quantitative analysis. Because the thing is, you run quantitative analysis on large scale data, but then qualitative can only work on small, sometime exemplary uh, scale. How do we blend this? How can we find an intersection? These, these approaches are there, outsourcing gamification and co-design could be a possible solution. And that's the, some of the tools we are, we are using for, for our studies. So what are we talking about when we talk about crowdsourcing? Well, the main point here is let's source information, ideas, sometimes money, not from small sets of contributors, but from a large crowd. That's the idea, right? Crowdsource. Now, the point is, as you see from, I mean, this is a, a, coming from uh, literature, the, the point is that crowdsourcing is a smart move towards increasing collective intelligence. The idea is that two brains together produce more ideas than just the sum of the two uh, productions individually. So bringing people together, contributing together, increases the quality of the information and the quality of collaboration. Um, when we talk about crowdsourcing in this setting, we also include things like some of you mentioned it already, uh, studies on public sources where people independently and fully, freely share their ideas. I'm thinking about social media, I'm thinking about digital platforms. Um, I'm also thinking about, uh, mm, uh, say local communities, okay? And that's one point. Second, sorry. Second point, how do we make people participate to crowdsourcing solutions? How do we make people, how do we convince people uh, to join our efforts? This is the point about uh, creating some kind of engagement. There's plenty of techniques, clearly you can pay people, so uh, there's plenty of studies about uh, uh, motivational, uh, say, ingredients, right? Money is a good motivation sometimes, but not always. Sometimes even just asking uh, voluntary contributions sometimes works better. And voluntary means that you do things for what? For common well-being? Well, not always. We saw in your study, right? Uh, sometimes, yes. Sometimes you do it but sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes you do it for yourself. So you do something for free because you believe that it's 
actually value for yourself as well. Or sometimes you just do things just to enjoy life, right? So that's the gamification part. Let's transform things into games so that you enjoy doing what you're doing. Uh, as you see, it's not just a nice word, it comes from solid scientific background, market background, okay, loyalty programs from your favorite store or, or, or video game design, whatever, you blend it together and you try to convince people to play and I will try to do that as well because you are invited to play all games later. And finally, cool design. What does it mean to run code design campaigns? It means we bring people, people together at the same table, but typically not just the usual ones. We don't want the same, always the same good old bunch of people at the table. And also we don't want people that are completely homogeneous in terms of demographics, Social extraction, geographical, political, and so on behavior. I hope it means. So the idea is whatever community you want to bring together, you need to build an intersection and then link to each other. This is the these are the three ingredients we have been working with. We ran a few studies on this, spanning different vertical uh, researches. I will just mention one here. That is, and these are connected to the things we've been talking about so far the effect of misinformation and fake news. This study that is instead a very quantitative study on crowds that span entire countries on digital platforms is a study about how the actual exposure to misinformation impacts on one specific behavior, that is vaccination hesitancy, okay? So, okay, the, we have, uh, say, interactive dashboards and so on. We run our studies on four countries only. It's quite massive and expensive in terms of effort. Um, you see the, the summary here on the right, France, Germany, Italy, in, in, in Europe. And then we have a separate study for the United States where we analyze the evolution of news sharing online, um, considering which share of the news was considered, let's say, uh, um, misinformation, fake news, or deviant perception of realities versus what was considered, let's say, informative and uh, uh, somehow consolidated. And then we started correlations. And then, for instance, here you have a, a, a zoom in, in, in for the Italian setting, where we started different geographical regions and we saw that regions that were more exposed and uh, that shared more misinformation were actually subject to higher vaccination, vaccination hesitancy. So uh, saying, and then this was quite evident in countries like Italy, but also in France and Germany, and more, even more in uh, countries like the United States, where the study showed very well that uh, the presence of groups, even small groups of, pe of probably partially organized people that pushed for some, uh, say, agenda about vaccination and COVID was actually altering the reaction of the population. Now, let me point out that it's not so clear what's the cause and what's the effect here, because we have correlation between misinformation and uh, rejections of vaccines, but you don't know whether misinformation causes rejection or rejections is actually generating further misinformation. So it's, it's something to value. These are the beginning, for instance, the study uh, done in the US was included in the last report of the President of the United States um, regarding the, the impact of the pandemic. Uh, this one was, now I don't have the pictures here for the US, but the I can point you to the papers. This was a study at a massive scale with crowdsourcing perspective. The other thing is, okay, what about the gamification and engagement? Okay, let's play. Essentially, we built also some other strategies that was meant, were meant for smaller scale analysis on particip participation to, to, um, say to, to game-like interactions. 
that were meant for triggering more specific um, understanding of behaviors. In particular, we wanted to go inside your, the, the, the personal and subjective perception of what happened. For instance, this one is a fully online game, a fully online game where essentially you are given a challenge or a scenario. You can build your own vision through the selection of pictures that in your personal perception represent the scenario. And then you can challenge other, other players, other participants to guess and understand uh, the, empath the, the empathic level what is their feeling and the connected the subjective perception of the of the facts? Okay, so it's an empathy oriented. Second game is instead a, 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 a hybrid game. Okay, we call it the lockdown escape room. It's an escape room game. I don't know if you are familiar with that. Essentially, you are locked in a room and you need to get out. You can go and play these kind of games in, in real settings. The game here is okay. Let's make the, the, the escape room, room the lockdown setting. So the game is we ask you to set up your room or the place where you live during the lockdown or the, the key pandemic uh, months. And then you need to escape from there. And while playing, we ask you questions. So it combines the fact that you somehow remember how you lived back then and we collect information, subjective information. Um, this is, we built this also with psychologists. It has also beneficial impact on the fact that you process what happened back then. Uh, and at the same time, it blends with the data-driven approaches because all of this ends up into uh, formal data collection practice. Final point, final example of gamification is this uh, third game, we call it the lockdown. Online that tries to let you recall what happened in the different phases of the pandemic, and again visualize that by selecting some uh, visual clues that let you recall what happened. Again, this is meant for subjective perspective in collection. So we could bring ten people around the table, and the people could select completely different pictures. Sometimes it's because um, they come from different countries, different experiences, but sometimes it's simply because their personal say, importance they gave to some facts with respect to others was the, okay? And that several cognitive studies show that that can be elicited through visual, graphical participation, okay, games. So it doesn't work if I send you a questionnaire. It works only if I let you remember really by, by visualizing things, what and how you did this thing. All right, so these parts, we don't have the results yet, but uh, we, we are collecting it through the execution of the game. So if you want, during the break, we have games on the table there, you can come and play. Otherwise, you have, I will send also the links for, for playing. Okay, we'll stop. That's it, thanks. Thank you. Are there, are there questions for Marco? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got to go play the game. Now. That was a really good presentation. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head with about gamification. The idea I was thinking of while you were doing that was that, for example, it would be like a card game. Mm -hmm. And you'd have, because in the pandemic, I received lots of WhatsApp texts with great misinformation which then developed into a family debate now if, if, if you could capture that information and fact check it and you'd be right or wrong and that would give you more emphasis as an individual to spread that information to your so-called inner circle and then you can maybe get points for that that was one idea the other idea was just that a covid game would be quite cool but you don't call it covid because that's scary <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, okay. yeah. 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 Uh, there are a few games based on the pandemic i mean if you just think about uh, science fiction movies it's 
all about yeah, the yeah, dynamics. Yeah. Right? Now they're a little bit less fashionable, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like but these are, yeah, yeah, but these are very good ideas. For instance, we didn't have games about uh, misinformation. So these two lines were a little bit separate in our studies, but this could be a good idea. It's something to bring in the next lockdown, actually. Thanks. Thank you. So um, I would like us now to um, thank the speakers. Thank Marco, thank Marta. And please do join outside for uh, coffee drinks and the game. And keep in touch. Thank you and good luck. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. We'll be in touch.